Hi, humans out there. I'm excited to share this episode where we'll explore the evolving world of smart cities with Internet of Things expert James Caton. But before we dive in, I have a quick message from a good friend of the show. Is your financial situation getting in the way of shaping your future? Greg Rotersheimer, former guest on the show, is a financial coach who can help you on your path to take control of your financial future. Call Greg today for a free consultation at 804-592-1871. That's 804-592-1871. You can also catch Greg on his podcast, Suburban Folk, available on all podcasting platforms. Now, let's dive into this episode of Humans Now and Then. Smart cities are no longer a thing of the future. Instead, they're a thing of today. Through the expanding availability and enablement of IoT at scale, we are finding ourselves figuratively and literally living within an increasingly connected world. In this episode, I speak to James Caton, expert in IoT and smart cities, about the benefits and risks of IoT at scale and why citizens should stay informed about the use of smart city technologies in their communities. The important thing to realize about smart cities is that as a citizen, that you should get engaged in the process and make sure that the politicians and the administration is investing the money in technologies that are relevant to your city. Because not every city is is the same. Uh, They all have different needs, uh, different focus areas. James Caton has spent 20 years helping governments and companies adopt IoT technologies to improve how they serve their customers. Recently, he spent three years in India building a $180 million smart cities business serving a dozen municipalities. Today, he advises companies and governments who seek to incorporate artificial intelligence into their operations. So, ready to learn more about the rapidly expanding world of smart cities? Let's discuss. I'm Rebecca Scott, and this is Humans Now and Then. James Caton, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Rebecca. I very much appreciate the time and the opportunity. Absolutely. So you have an area of expertise that I think a lot of listeners will be interested to learn more about, and that's in relation to smart cities and Internet of Things, or things that we always see as IoT out in the world, another acronym for us to to know and, and love in our lives. But IoT is something that we hear a lot about, but I think a lot of folks would benefit from understanding a little bit more about how that might impact their day-to-day lives going forward, which is really, we're not talking about far in the future. We're talking about smart cities that exist today in different areas of the world and some of the interesting kind of complexities and challenges, as well as benefits of those IoT opportunities and smart cities um, out around the world. So why don't we start by talking, you could talk a little bit about your experience in working with smart cities, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, of course. Of course, Rebecca. So what's interesting is that the IoT is something that people, I'm sure, have heard or read about online, and they've had some discussions around. But what's interesting about IoT is it's moved from the back office, something that happens and only a few people can understand and benefit from, to the front office. 15, 20 years ago, the IoT was something that advanced manufacturing labs and facilities would be using to do really cool and, and sophisticated stuff. But what's happened over the last maybe five to 10 years is it's moving more into the realm of daily life, things that uh, you and me and, and the average person are touching and seeing, right? So, you know, just to give you a really basic example, the Alexa devices today and the Google Home devices are, at the end of the day, an IoT device. It's, it's a physical device connected to the internet that does something of value for you. So that's an example of a consumer device that everybody sees and touches every day. And what's happening is that cities are starting to to adopt these kinds of devices and deploying them around the city to do very specific things like monitor traffic, monitor air pollution, water quality, et cetera, things that ostensibly are of benefit to citizens. And the administrations, the mayors, and the governors want to do these things to improve quality of life for people. And what, what's most interesting about the IoT is it's, it's a shift that's happened over the last five years, and that is that it is becoming more accessible. So 10, 15 years ago, the cities that could purchase and deploy and could understand an IoT device, a smart city device, 
were the big cities, London, Mumbai, New York City, Los Angeles. But what's happening because of cloud and because of just, you know, the ubiquity of these devices, we're finding that your average city and your smaller cities that no one's ever heard of can very quickly become a smart city. And those are initiatives that they are adopting because they have good political benefits, citizens appreciate it and enjoy, and they're not that expensive to implement. So it's a win-win for everybody. Right. We had a previous conversation where we discussed your experience in some of those types of cities that aren't the large cities, that are the smaller cities that actually started to realize some level of benefit in relation to IoT or smart city uh, technology. So I would be interested to know a little bit more about your experience then, especially in, in India, which I thought was really fascinating when we talked last time about those smaller cities. What was the things that they learned and what were some of the challenges that they faced as well? Yeah, what's interesting about India is that they moved into the smart city space five to 10 years after uh, most Western cities, the larger cities. And what they learned, I think, is that there is no single definition of a smart city. There is no template that people can apply and they automatically become a smart city. And if somebody is approaching you and telling you that if you buy this one thing and you'll become a smart city, then they're probably trying to sell you something, right? Buy one of mine and you'll be a smart city. And, and to a large extent, that's not true. The one thing that, that I think they learned in India was that, it, that each city is unique. And if you're going to move into a smart city program, one of the first things you need to do really is engage your city and understand what are the unique needs for the city, what technologies would be relevant to them. And generally, this is driven by a number of things. It could be demographics. Um, it could be the surrounding environment. Uh, desert cities like Jaipur in India have a water uh, resource management problem. In the Netherlands, uh, the right water stat, you know, their water issue is a little different. There's too much water and they're below sea level. Um, so each city will, will look at the technologies that are relevant and available to them and deploy those that, that are important. So the wonderful thing is that there's an opportunity for citizens to take ownership of how their cities become smarter. And I would actually insist that citizens have to take ownership and understand what exactly is being deployed and for what reason, because cities can start in a certain direction with smart cities technology, and it can quickly expand into areas that are unexpected and in some aspects may be unwanted by citizens. For example, recently in San Diego, they've realized that the smart streetlights that they deployed in San Diego a few years ago are being used very differently. Okay. Um, the city of San Diego deployed, you know, hundreds and thousands of streetlights to monitor foot traffic and car traffic for congestion management and to manage uh, parking to see when cars pull into a parking spot and when they pull out and reading the license plate, and you could potentially send them a bill for their 36 minutes that they parked in that spot. And what's happened was is uh, police, as they tried to solve crimes and, and issues in the city, would look around and, and they would see that camera and they would say, well, I can use that for this. So cameras that initially were for traffic management, congestion management, parking management, are now being used to solve crimes which you could argue is not a bad thing. There's a benefit to that. But the next step, obviously, is real-time monitoring of people, warrantless monitoring of people. And if you look at that in the context of Portland today and other cities where, where there's uh, protests and demonstrations, there's the opportunity for the government to then start monitoring these events using tools and technologies that weren't initially intended for that. So the really important thing here, I think, is for citizens to understand what technology is being applied in the city uh, for what purposes, and then uh, make sure that the city is abiding by that, or at least that citizens are aware that these technologies are now being used for, for different purposes, and, and citizens should be aware and approving of that to a certain extent. What's interesting is that in India, they did take that, that robust public engagement approach, and they realized that every city was indeed different. For example, Mumbai, focus on Mumbai was very much public safety. So the smart city program there deployed some number, some, you know, six, 7,000 cameras around the city for public safety reasons. And what drove that is that uh, about 10 years ago, they had a terrible terrorist incident in Mumbai where uh, hotels were attacked and a couple hundred people died. So Mumbai, as the financial capital of India, very much conscious of security. Other cities like Pune, which is near uh, Mumbai, it's in the hill uh, region, the hill country of, of India. Their focus was traffic management, a uh, small city growing very quickly, 
uh, middle class modernizing, um, you know, they have more money, uh, they're buying the nicer things, buying cars. So congestion management has become a big issue. Um, and similarly, the, the other major initiative in Pune was connectivity, trying to bridge the digital divide and deploying free Wi-Fi in municipal areas. So that was something that was important to them. They're a college town, young town and growing. Um, another city, just to give you a final example, was Nagpur, it's a city a little more distant from, from the major regions. And their focus also was digital connectivity, but the approach they took was deploying fiber around the city, 1,600 kilometers of fiber to offer broadband to the, the rural regions around the city. Um, so their focus was a little different. So the important thing to realize about smart cities is that as a citizen, that you should get engaged in the process and make sure that the politicians and the administration is investing the money in technologies that are relevant to your city, because not every city is, is the same. Uh, they all have different needs, uh, different focus areas. Yeah, and that's really important for folks, I think, to think about or really just understand. You know, as IoT technology continues to expand, more data is being collected about people. Uh, but when I mean, you think about out in the world, what are the benefits that we can gain through smart cities? So you mentioned like water quality, internet connectivity. And so for some of those smaller cities that really um, need to have this level of infrastructure in place, you know, saves lives. It allows people to connect to information they would not have been able to connect to previously. It's really critical. It's a game changing to those communities. But to your point, there's an opportunity for people and maybe even a responsibility for people and municipalities to really think about people's privacy and how we should consider uh, some level of ethics in the application of these technologies to be able to respect the privacy of public citizens. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is that as citizens today, as, as digital citizens, we all expect to be monitored and followed as a trade-off of living in today's digital society. You know, the social media companies, the marketing companies online, right? Your trade-off for the free email and for connecting with your friends on social media and for using all of these free services is that you know you're being tracked and monitored and profiled. And you give your implied consent to do that in the terms of, of service on these websites. The truth is we don't read it and we never know what's going to happen with our data, but there is some level of consent in that. What's different about cities is cities are installing cameras and they're installing air pollution sensors and they're installing, you know, they're monitoring the GPS locations of how people move around. But what's interesting about cities is you never click on a terms of, of service for a city. Right. When you enter a city, they don't give you a little document that says you're being monitored and click here if you want to enter the city. Um, it's your home and you move about the city doing doing your normal business. And to a certain extent, you're being monitored and profiled without your consent. So that's what makes it more important, I think, for citizens to really understand what cities are doing with the data. You know, is it video data? Is it audio data? Are they monitoring traffic? Are they doing more than that? Are they following you around the city? Uh, Citizen A went to this corner, then went to that corner and walked into this building and left 15 minutes later, right? So it's important to understand that because there has been no implied consent and there's no walls around that, right? The example in San Diego where the citizens approved an initiative to deploy video cameras for parking and now it's being used for other purposes. So that's the important thing about cities, I think, is the, the fact that there's no implied consent. So hence, citizens need to be proactively aware and proactively inquire as to what cities are doing with this data. Wow. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to think about there. And I, I really like that differentiation you made between the consent we provide online for giving our information. I mean, all of us at this point are pretty aware that our data is a commodity, and we provide that data to get stuff, whether it be, you know, services or, you know, things that we benefit from, uh, whether it be free services on a website or, you know, free memberships and, and so forth. We give away our data for, for that benefit. But without that opportunity within the smart city, and no real good way to gain that level of consent for providing information about our activities and so forth. It's, it's an interesting thing to think about, not even just for the citizens, but also for um you know, the cities themselves and legislators and, and so forth about where do the boundaries lie? And then thinking forward, like what, what was the future hold? So what do you think the future holds for smart cities? Well, what's interesting, I think, is COVID has kind of changed that a little bit. It's accelerating the move to a smarter city. 
They may be changing the direction that cities are going to. They may be moving away from monitoring air pollution and predicting air pollution to more healthcare scenarios, contact tracing, symptom tracking at hospitals so that you know if there's a hotspot in a particular neighborhood versus another. But what I think is really incumbent on cities is communicating the benefits of the smart technology because there are significant benefits. The IoT, the smart cities technologies can do two things for cities. They can give you a real-time view of what's happening. You're gathering data in real time from sensors or from from systems, systems like hospital systems, you know, the number of beds that are occupied, the symptoms of the people that are coming in in the morning by noon, or maybe almost immediately, depending on your system, you can have a real time view across the city or across your state of what's happening, right? Traffic, you know, air pollution, water management, depending on what you've installed as a city, the city can have a real time view of all of that. And what's more important today is that it's a remote view of what's happening. So in today's world where you don't want to have people walking around the city, talking to people, entering buildings, right, because of COVID, the IoT and the smart cities technologies allow you to remotely understand what's happening, okay? And then more importantly, once you have that data, you can use that data with analytics to then do predictions on what could happen. And this gives you the ability to prepare and react in in an optimal manner against events. So for example, there's one U.S. state in the Midwest. It gets very cold in the wintertime. The conditions can change very quickly. So they've deployed a technology where based on humidity, temperature, and a bunch of other sensors that they've put out across the highway system, they can detect and predict when hazardous fog conditions will develop, right, two or three hours ahead. And then as drivers go down the road, they can start advising them in advance that we believe there's going to be hazardous fog or windy conditions, then you should be more careful, okay? Similarly with COVID and with pandemics, right? You're able to predict and plan ahead on supplies, right? And on hospital beds and prepare how all of these city services can react to environmental conditions and improve the health of citizens, right? Improve the well-being of citizens. So the interesting thing about IoT and smart cities in the COVID area is that it, it allows you to generate all of this value remotely for the citizens. But the issue is, is that cities are very bad at communicating this. So while people focus on the risks, people focus on the negatives of uh, smart cities technologies, the reality is, is that there are significant benefits, but those benefits are generally not visible and not communicated to citizens. So while citizens need to be proactive and understand what's happening, cities need to equally Uh, be responsible for communicating the benefits. Why are they doing this? You know, what's the benefit to people, to the city, to the society for all these different technologies? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The things you just outlined, I mean, a lot of it has the potential of, again, saving lives, has the potential of making our lives better, you know, moving forward, which is tremendous benefit. And we definitely don't want to discount that benefit. Um, So I love that fact that you brought that dialogue between citizens and municipalities is critical so they both understand the concerns that the community may have in relation to their privacy, uh, but also the benefits that cities are trying to get from installing and, and using these types of IoT devices or smart city technology in order to improve lives in their regions and their areas and their communities. I do want to air, you know, bring up one other area of risk that I know folks have had concerns about is that once these technologies really become ingrained, uh, both within our cities and in our ways of life, the security risk associated with that. So people talk about what's the potential that something can be hacked and then there's some kind of pervasive bug that creeps through the entire system because everything's connected. What kind of security concerns would you have in relation to your knowledge about smart cities And what are some of the opportunities that we have to ensure that those networks remain safe? So security is a very valid concern in IoT and smart cities. I do believe that it's becoming less of a risk. And it's becoming less of a risk because the players in this space, the companies in this space, are becoming more sophisticated and because these technologies are moving to the cloud. And, you know, the major cloud companies, the Amazons and the Googles and the Microsofts of the world, they're spending more on technology to protect their cloud than a city ever will. And the skills that they have, the people that they have protecting 
the cloud, protecting the data and protecting the systems at these you know large cloud players. Those people are more skilled than any employee that an average city is going to have on staff. So the fact that the big players, the industrial players are moving into this space gives me a high level of confidence in security management of all of these systems. That being said, obviously, there's always a risk. You know, we've had cars for almost 100 years and people are still breaking into cars, right? People still break into your home. So there's always a risk that that might happen, but um, I think it is much less a risk these days than it was five or 10 or 15 years ago, primarily because the industry is becoming more mature and more responsive and and understanding of, of the potential risks. Right. That's definitely reassuring when we think about the level of risk that could bubble up from just one breach across that network. However, knowing that kind of those big players in the space are are there to try to ensure that doesn't happen or protect against or even just create barriers amongst the the network um, where it would contain those type of security risks is, is really something to that's important. I think this is another thing that I think is really good for people to be aware of and educate themselves about so that they understand not even just the risks, but also have some level of comfort in understanding the work that's being done and being improved upon uh, in the area of security. Yeah. And cities are making that transition, that migration. Cities used to have their own data centers. They used to have their own technical staff. And you would see advertisements in the local newspaper saying we need a system administrator, a security person, you know, and they put out a list of four or five people that they would need to hire. And then they would hire those people, put them in an office and tell them, protect this data center. And cities are moving away from that. Instead of having to hire technicians locally and hope that they're certified and to speak to the highest global standards, today they're able to procure the smart cities technologies from a cloud vendor who is spending tens of billions of dollars a year, right, in upgrading the technology infrastructure and in hiring the right people. And so they're able to offload system management, security management, you know, resiliency of the system, et cetera, to a company that is highly invested, highly skilled, and highly specialized in, in those areas. So cities, large and small, are very much appreciative of that and are making that transition. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So kind of thinking through all of these different opportunities and risks about smart cities, but also kind of like the larger dynamic of the Internet of Things. Obviously, like we talked about, there's a lot of amazing opportunities for us to improve our lives, improve people's ability to be healthy and to be safe, um, which are really critical to, you know, well-functioning society in the future. But in general, what makes you optimistic about the future? What's most interesting about smart cities and technology in general is really how accessible it's becoming to almost anybody around the world. There's a phrase that a lot of us have heard that says, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And I think that phrase is relevant in a world where the future is defined in terms of uh, physical goods, right? The new car, the telephone, the air conditioner, the new laptop, et cetera. But in today's modern society, the future is really defined in terms of digital services, things like digital uh, learning, telemedicine, access to to banking services, right? A lot of people who live in rural areas uh, and don't live near a bank in the developing world just never had access to banking services. Um, And today, if you have a mobile phone and and internet connectivity, you're able to have world-class banking services in, in parts of the world that five years ago didn't have that. So what's interesting to me is that the future now is, be- is becoming more accessible to everybody. Give somebody a phone, give them a telephone plan, and they can almost immediately have access to all of the information around the world uh, via Google. Uh, they can have access to you know, a myriad of kinds of services that can improve your life, credit for loans, banking, telemedicine, learnings, online, et cetera. So for me, what makes me optimistic is really the fact that because of cloud services and because of mobile phones, anybody in the world can have access to the leading technologies in any area, and they can have it accessible to them at a low cost. Whereas 10 years ago, people lived in a little bubble and they didn't have access to you know, what 
the urban people had, you know, the citizens had. Today, the fact that more people around the world have access to modern digital services that can improve their lives, that makes me very optimistic, you know, about smart cities and IoT and digital services in general. Absolutely. What a great opportunity to you know, reach those communities that were, I'd say, left out, I suppose, in the past due to either economic conditions, uh, political conditions, or just geography. So you're right. That's a that's an amazing thing to think about, not even just connecting the entire world more effectively, but giving those folks in those areas that were previously disconnected an opportunity to benefit from this technology in ways that, again, save lives, make lives better Uh, make our existence uh, more fulfilling and less isolated. What great opportunities for the future. So when we think about, we talked about a lot of great things that could happen, a few things in relation to risk associated with the level of connectivity we have as well, but what would be something that would concern you about the future? It's not so much a concern. It's, It's more of a next step, I think. And that comes down to data privacy. We've seen recently in Europe, uh, that the Europeans are moving in a direction uh, of trying to better regulate how people's data that is generated online and kept online is used and protected. They started off with GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and that basically is a framework that tells companies what they can and can't do with your personal data and that they have a responsibility to be open uh, with people around what they do with the data. And then in the last couple of days, the European Union has has publicized the fact that they're going to create a market for people's data, okay, to monetize people's data and regulate how that happens. And it's not really clear tactically how they're going to do that. But the basic idea is that the European Union is going to aggregate personal data of of some sort, and they're going to make it available to companies as part of a, a public trust. And companies that want to use that data for marketing and personalization would then have to provide some financial compensation, right, to that trust. And then in some manner, that would then revert back to the people, right? And it's not clear how they're going to do that. Uh, Maybe it's a credit against your taxes, or maybe it's a check they cut you twice a week, right? We don't know. But at least they're thinking about that. They've established a framework for regulating how data is used, and they've made it very public. And now they're moving in the direction of creating a trust so that people can get compensated for the data that they provide. So in North America, we haven't gone to that step yet. Uh, The state of California has done a little bit of that, and they're they're sort of the leader in the U.S. for uh, establishing norms around how data should be used. And I do see us moving in that direction, especially as the commercial industry gathers more data on people in cities. Also, um, they will be gathering data, and cities are strapped for cash, especially in the COVID area. Budgets are increasing, tax revenues are decreasing from businesses that have been closed. So I do see cities at some point looking at the data that they've collected and trying to understand how they can monetize that, right? And the monetization of that obviously would then come back into the city services and ostensibly it would be a benefit to the people, right? But that has to be explained. Well, first that has to be figured out how they're going to do that. And then it needs to be clearly explained to the citizens. So I do see that as something that will happen and has to happen in this country. The Europeans are a few years ahead of us in that. And I suspect that we'll look at that and we'll see what worked and what didn't work. And we'll come up with a model for the U.S. Right. And that that is interesting. I wasn't aware of the marketplace that they were developing there in Europe. And I'm going to definitely learn more about that because that's fascinating. Yeah. And I suspect that regulators in, here in the U.S. will look closely at that and, and legislators in Congress. They'll look at that in detail and try to understand what might be good and, you know, and work in our context. Because just like every city is different, every nation and every region is different. Our context might require, you know, different characteristics of a similar approach. So I expect we'll do something, but it'll be different from what they're doing in Europe. Oh, certainly. And given it's an election year, I don't imagine we're going to hear anything about that anytime in the next few months. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yes, I uh, agree. I doubt that. Uh, there's other things we're focused on this year. <laughs> yes. So let me ask you another question, which is just seems like there's so much opportunity here still. And I know a lot of folks are trying to get in on IoT, right? Just trying to new innovations, new companies trying to enter the marketplace and sell their products and services around the Internet of Things. What do you think is the biggest opportunity in relation to innovation in the IoT space? So. Actually, that's a very interesting 
point, and it's something that is normally not considered when cities and countries think about smart cities and IoT. Smart cities are usually sold to citizens as a deployment of technology, an application of technology that will provide very specific benefits, cleaner water, less traffic, better health, et cetera, right? And the technology does have those benefits. Absolutely, um, it can help in all of those areas. But what's interesting, and this is something that I noticed in, in India, and honestly, I don't know that they have promoted or publicized this enough. When the smart cities program started in India, most of the, the technology companies and vendors that came in to provide those solutions to the cities in India, the majority of them were uh, multinationals from outside of India coming in and trying to sell their solutions. Very quickly, within a couple of years, the local ecosystem of smart cities vendors stood up and started competing with the multinationals very, very successfully. And some of those companies today are, have moved out of India and are competing globally with the multinationals that had gone into India four or five years ago. So one of the hidden benefits of applying smart cities technologies is that local companies see that as an opportunity to grow and expand their skills and have new services and new solutions and new products. And they will soon start exporting and selling outside of their region. So very successful in India. I've seen the same thing in Europe, right? A local startup ecosystem grow. So there's economic benefits to doing something like this. The opportunities, I believe, really depend on what your level of interest is, right? There's opportunities in financial inclusion, right? Digital payments, e-payments, e-banking, et cetera. There's a large percentage of unbanked people in the U.S. Obviously health, tremendous opportunities in health today, telemedicine, predictive analytics, you know, for medical issues. And then, you know, the, the traditional growth areas, traffic management, water management, et cetera. I've gotten a lot of questions from uh, people in the technology industry who are doing some cool stuff, right? Maybe in AI, uh, maybe in devices. And typically these companies are technologists, right? And they come to me and, uh, and they tell me, James, I'd like to apply this to smart cities. I'd like to do something that can benefit the public. And one thing to realize to everyone that's listening that might be in this position is that cities and government purchase differently. And it could be very frustrating to try to understand how they buy and how to position your product and how to, to get in and talk to the right people. A sale in the commercial world could be done as quickly as a day or, you know, more realistically, uh, you know, a month or two months. In public sector, trying to sell the cities, because they have the responsibility to make sure that tax dollars are spent appropriately, they will go through a lot more due diligence and a lot more hoops and checks in any procurement. So if you're a technologist, I would highly encourage you to jump into this space and try to apply your, your solutions for the public benefit. But I would also encourage you to find a partner, find someone that is familiar with the space. Be patient. It may take some time. Uh, it may be a little bit frustrating at times with all the information they're going to ask you for, uh, but the payoff is tremendous. The scale of how you might apply your technology is uh, incredibly large. Um, you can impact millions and billions of people if you have the right solution. But uh, just realize that the, the, that you'll need patience and you'll likely need help from somebody who knows how to deal with cities and procurement managers in cities and requirements, etc. So what I would say is if you're interested in the application of technology in, in ways that benefit society, the opportunity is there. It's really based on your interests, whether it's health or banking, etc., the most important thing is going to be building up the technical skills and building up those capabilities and creating a technical solution. In many ways, those are very specialized skills and uh, sometimes they're hard to find and that'll be the challenge, right? People that have those technical skills very much in demand. So it's, it's hard to build up a team that can help you build those solutions. But there's technology companies everywhere and you can reach out and engage them to help build a solution build a digital services offering that you can then take to market. You don't have to do it all by yourself. You can always bring in a partner or two or three partners who have different skills and build that out. 
Yeah, what a great opportunity to make a huge difference in the quality of our lives in the future. So, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of folks that will hear marketing opportunities, too. And those things exist. And we can certainly find bits and pieces of things that can make our lives easier in different ways. But the things that have the real staying power, the things that have the real value are those things that disrupt our way of life in a way that makes it better. So I hope that encourages anybody out there who might be listening who might be thinking about a career in IoT or getting involved in this type of technology to think about ways you can make a real impact in the world, a real difference that uh, makes life better in the future. What, what's better than that? Absolutely. I, I'm very optimistic about where technology is taking us and the opportunities. I'll tell you a final closing story. My mother is from South America, and I grew up in South America, and I have you know, dozens and dozens of cousins and, and uncles. And I have one cousin who lives in a small town in Peru that most people have never heard of. They have internet access. And this young man went online and built an online business, selling stuff globally. And he's one guy in the middle of Peru, and he's built a small global business. And 15 years ago, that would have been hard to imagine. But given how ubiquitous technology is today, given the fact that you can teach yourself a lot of the skills that are needed to deploy this technology through online learning. The opportunity there is really for anybody anywhere, you know, who's motivated to learn, become skilled and build a business, regardless of where you are in the world, right? If you have the motivation and if you have the interest, the opportunity is there. And it's an amazing opportunity uh, that wasn't around 10 or 15 years ago. So good times, exciting times for anybody. Oh, absolutely. And, and you talk about an opportunity for innovation. Here we're talking about voices that would not have necessarily had an opportunity to be part of the conversation in the past. Having access to entry into this type of marketplace where um, these innovations are happening that make a big difference. Wow, what an exciting thing to think about, getting all these people involved in, in making a difference in the world. So thanks for providing that optimism for us today and that maybe invitation for anyone who's thinking about getting involved and in shaping a better future through IoT technologies, data, predictive analytics, and so forth. Because not even just is that the way of the future, but we're talking about making real differences in the quality of our lives, and that's meaningful work. And then the other, of course, call to action we talked about earlier was, you know, if you're just a citizen, maybe you're not a tech person, that's fine. If you're a citizen out in the world, here's an opportunity for you to engage with your local community to understand their direction in technology, understand the application of technology in that community, and advocate for yourself and for your community, community members and what's important to you and understand not even just the risks of, of that technology, but also the benefits to you and to your community. So James Caton, thank you for these very important reminders and this great information for folks to understand a little bit more about IoT and how smart cities work. So thanks so much for joining me. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I, I appreciate the time. Thank you. James sheds light on the immense benefits of IoT in smart cities, which allow us to connect the unconnected, improve health outcomes, and keep our roads and communities safe. He also reminds us that these benefits do come with some risk, such as potential loss of privacy, data and network security, as well as the use of these technologies beyond their intended purpose. The good news is that we have the ability to get involved to shape the evolution of smart cities and IoT technologies. It's up to us to keep informed about how technology is applied in our communities and how it impacts us, our families, and our neighbors. This will not only allow us to advocate for ourselves and those in our community, but also help us understand how our communities are improved by the use of this technology. If you're a company or a technologist who's interested in making an impactful difference in the world, smart city technologies may be for you. By taking the time to learn the skills and partnering with those who understand the ins and outs of government contracts, you may uncover a tremendous opportunity to improve the lives of people and communities across the world. You might also find other opportunities to make a difference through bolstering the security of networks or working in the ever-expanding field of digital ethics. What's interesting is that there's an opportunity here for all of us to get involved. As a citizen, as a community leader, as a technologist, or as an organization. 
What a tremendous opportunity for us to work together to shape a better future. So go on, go help shape the future. To learn more about James Caton and his experience with Smart Cities, you can find him on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash IN slash J-M-C-A-T-O-N. That's linkedin.com slash IN slash J-M Caton. I am Rebecca Scott, and this is Humans Now and Then. Hosted and produced by Rebecca Scott. Episode notes can be found at humansnowandthen.com. Thank you for listening.